caught my wife cheating with a boy the same age as our son, devised a plan and turned her life into a nightmare. Update Christmas Day was the first full day I spent in my new apartment. It's still a work in progress, as I have more stuff I want to get, but overall I've made it my home, since I'm going to be here for two years at least. My boys and the eldest GF came over and spent a good portion of the day with me. The GF brought over treats she'd made, and also whipped up a really nice meal. I got to sit and talk with my sons in a way I hadn't done in a really long time, and it was nice. My big sis also came over with more goodies and hung out with us also. It had been the first time she'd seen her nephews in nearly a year. Having all of them around did me some real good, as if I were by myself I think I would have just drank myself into a stupor. Everyone cleared out around 8-ish and I decided I wanted to go hang out with Joey and his wife Claudia. Hung out with them for a couple hours, had a couple drinks and then went back home. The next big development happened last week, December 29, 20. Around midday, I get a text from Nina asking if I was busy that night. I of course wasn't so we agreed to meet up after I got off of work. She shows up and we go to a diner not far from where I work. Here in NYC, we're doing indoor dining at 25% capacity thanks to the Rona, but there's mostly no trouble getting seats because so many of us opt not to dine out as much these days regardless. So after we're seated and order our food, Nina pretty much lays all of her cards on the table, and honestly, I knew this was coming. She basically confessed that she's like me all the way back since we were teenagers, but never got the chance to tell me since Sue swooped in and scooped me up before she could. For context, I've known Nina longer than Sue by two years. As I mentioned, she's been the fourth point of my social square of myself, Oz and Joey. We were the social outcasts in high school. The raver kids who didn't fit into all of the other cliques. Back then, Nina had a weight problem and was diabetic. She was the heavyset goth chick who was super cool, but no guy would ever give a second glance at. But we always had chemistry. These days, Nina is a personal trainer and yoga instructor. She was the ugly duckling who grew into one hell of a beautiful swan if I must say. Long story short, we decided that upon the finalization of my divorce, we are going to start seeing each other. And yeah, I slept with her that night. Took her back to my new pad and we had a grand old time. Am I ashamed of sleeping with her? Hell no. Nina's been a better friend to me than Sue ever was. That's not saying Sue wasn't my best friend. But through the near quarter of a century, I've known Nina, she's always supported me. Even so much as A I learned that day willingly taking a step back from her own feelings to allow me to pursue and eventually start a life with Sue. That resonated with me on a level I didn't think it would. That kind of selflessness towards another person is the definition of real love. I know, it sounds like I'm just trying to justify in my head that sleeping with her was the right decision. To me it was, and I plan on exploring what's to come with Nina and I with total commitment. Okay, on to yesterday, the day I met my wife and her lawyer to discuss the divorce. It's now been two weeks since I ghosted my STBXW. This past Monday, I got a phone call from my staking that Sue's attorney has scheduled a meeting for us to discuss the terms of divorce on January 6, 21, which was yesterday. I met with him the Tuesday morning to discuss the terms I'm wanting. Long story short, uncontested divorce under the grounds of marital neglect from Sue. My terms are full division of assets, and me selling my half of the house ownership to her, she can have it. We keep our respective vehicles, I keep my cabin in the Poconos. And under the pretenses of marital neglect, she gets no spousal support from me. As for 17, what I'll refer to my son is from here on, he's free to choose who he wants to reside with following the divorce which will most likely be me. So Wednesday comes and I show up to my lawyer's office dressed in my Johnny Cash best. My wife and her lawyer. She looks like crap. Barely holding it together. I give the stone face. I won't bore you with the lawyer babble, but her lawyer presented an offer for terms of reconciliation. I shot them down almost as soon as she finished listing the details of the request. Like I said, I'll spare you the details of the meeting. 
Long story short, we agreed to a legal separation, leading to an uncontested divorce. The only revision is that I will pay her $653 a month of temporary spousal support to cover the cost of utilities until she's gainfully employed again, yep, she got fired for ducking POS. He got canned as well, up to a year after the finalization. I make enough that it won't hurt me financially even if she drags her feet finding a new job, and she's got enough in her savings to live off of for quite some time. Once a full calendar year has passed after the finalization date of the divorce has passed, she's on her own. Small price to pay for being rid of her. It'll take roughly three months for things to go through, so early April if there's no cock-ups, I'll be free of her. So after the meeting, my lawyer gives me some final words before telling he'll be in touch to update me on the progress of the filing. Back out on the street, Sue chases me down and asks can we talk. I figured I'd give her at least that. She held it together fairly well in the meeting, but outside let the waterworks flow saying how sorry she was and how she never meant it to go as far as it did. She says she never expected to fall in love with P.O.S., but knew when she thought I was cheating how wrong it was to betray her own husband in such a way. She asked, could I ever find it in my heart to forgive me, and that maybe in a few years, could we try to start over? That she can't imagine what her life is going to be without me. I tell her to start imagining it soon, because this will be the last time I ever speak to or see her. I tell her that 17 is almost a man, and old enough to make his own choices as to his own future. I say that I gave her half of my life, and every ounce of love I had unconditionally, and she in her own words fell in love with another man. That there is absolutely no chance of me ever forgiving her. That all of the love I had for her was slowly ruined all of those months that she confided and professed her love to POS, rather than coming to me and telling me she had any form of issue with how things were going with us. I told her I loved who she once was, but I hate who stands before me, and that if I never see her again it'll be too soon. He we are on the sidewalk in midtown Manhattan, her making a scene crying her eyes out. A couple folk walk by and give side glances, but at that point I didn't care. I wasn't about to publicly offense her, I pretty much already socially and professionally destroyed her, but I needed to get the last bit of emotion I had for her out. I finished my telling her I didn't regret the 23 years I spent being her husband. I regretted that in 23 years she decided the easy way out was the better option and that for 23 years I thought she was mine, but it turned out it was just my turn. Put in my rakens, turned around and walked away. Later that night, he father calls me and apologizes. He praises me for always being a good man to his daughter, and tells me he's ashamed of her and that he raised her better than what she did. Not gonna lie, I'm going to miss the old man. My dad died years ago, so he's always been my default father figure since. But I can't see myself maintaining a relationship with anyone on her side of the family. After that call, I went on FB and symbolically changed my relationship status to divorced. Yeah, it's not final yet but in my eyes it's over and done. Like I said, when I make a post on FB it's an event, so plenty of folks started hitting me up over messenger asking question, and I laid it all out that I filed for divorce with Sue earlier in the day. Of course Nina called me, shocked that I pulled the trigger, so fast. Obviously I was already in the process of it when we spoke, but she had no way of knowing how far it was along. I asked her if she could come over, and of course she comes a-runnin'. We knocked boots again, but this time she stayed the night. We laid in my bed and talked into the wee hours of the morning, and I haven't felt this level of relief and connection in really long time. Nina gets me, and I can't get enough being around her. Since the day she confided in me she's all that's been on my mind. Yeah, I know some folk are gonna say it's ducked up I'm moving on so fast, but as far as I'm concerned my marriage ended the day P.O.S. let Sue touch his pecker, so I'm about due. So yeah. That's it. That's the end. My divorce is in the works, and I'm moving on to start a relationship with Nina. I know in a comment response to someone I said I'd probably not marry ever again but that was before Nina King cling to me about how she felt towards me, and I can't deny that I feel the same. We're going to take it slow, and we're not announcing anything until the divorce with Sue is legal and official. As for Sue, I could give a flying duck what happens to her. She could move P.O.S. into our old home for all I care. 
I'll be getting my money for the house over the course of 2021, for quarterly installments, and aside from the $653 I will pay out directly to her savings account monthly, I never have to see or speak to her again. As only my closest friends, two sons, older sister and mother have my new contact info, and I've completely blocked my STBXW on all social outlets, she has had no means of reaching me since I left her Christmas Eve, but some are mutual friends still do. Last night, I'm hanging out in my apartment and I get a voice call notification on Messenger from one of said friends, one of the few who hadn't abandoned her following me outing her affair. She didn't waste any time when I answered, and said she had went to check on Sue, the STBXW, and found her passed out in the bedroom, foaming out of the found with two bottles of empty pills next to her. She's in the ICU in critical, but stable condition. The doctor said that she will likely pull through, she's clearly not going to be well after. She begged and pleaded for me to come. Her parents and two of her sisters were also there at the hospital. My guess is they were notified after the hospital attempted to notify me, but Sue would still have my old hashtag as her emergency contact. I simply told her no. Sue's not my problem anymore, and she clearly decided she wanted to take the easy way out rather than deal with the shame and agony of the 23-year marriage she blew up. I then told her friend that if Sue's family were there, they can help her sort out the pieces, but as far as Sue and I are concerned, there is no Sue and I anymore. I then ended the call. I've had a few hours to sleep on it, and my sons called me this morning asking if I knew. I told them yes, but I also let both of them know that if they want to be there and supportive of their mother, I will not hold it against them or judge them for it. She is their mother after all. But I myself wash my hands of her and care little to nothing about what she does for or to herself anymore. They were both a little taken back by this, but respected my stance. However now that the news has broke about her ending attempt, many of those friends who dropped her are all starting to surface again, and saying I need to be there for her. That even despite what she did to me, I need to support her in her time of need. I've also been informed that her AP tried to visit her this morning, but wasn't allowed because he's not family. I'm getting dogpiled on to go see her, but I feel nothing for this woman anymore. I haven't for a very long time. I checked out during the process of getting my payback for her betrayal, and I stand by the fact that I don't care at all for what she's done. In fact it makes me hate her even more. She's the one who was unfaithful. She's the one who though a near year long fling with a guy five years older than her oldest son was worth destroying 23 years. And now that she has to face the consequences of her choices, she chooses the most selfish way of deal with. Even now, seeing as she's in all likelihood going to survive, she's cultivated immediate sympathy from everyone who took her to task, and I'm being made out to look like the jaded ex-husband unwilling to sympathize for her by most her family, not her dad. He's reached out to me over the last few hours and said he respects my decision to stay away. It's like I never even truly knew this woman. 23 years and it comes to this. Yes, I know the way I broke things off with her may have put her in a poor mental state. But now a whole new can of worms has been opened up because either she had a complete mental breakdown and decided to self-delete herself or she made an extremely risky and calculated move to call favor back from people who just weeks prior condemned her for betraying me. She cheated on me, and now she's the victim? Sorry if this comes off as rantish, but I'm here trying to wrap my brain around this. I want to be perfectly clear, I am not going to visit Sue. She waved a right to me caring about her well-being the day she let P.O.S., my personal nickname for her lover, put his Johnson inside her. This might come off as heartless, because despite the cool, calm collected way I've been throughout my who ordeal my feelings are still very much raw, but I don't give a duck about this woman. Haven't for a very long time. I'm aware I'm going to be vilified by a number of folk here. I don't much give a crap. Think of me, however you want, if you were in my shoes, you'd see her actions vastly different. Some of you folks are going to go look up my post history and see the story of what I did to her. And you're going to draw the conclusion that her ending attempt was my fault. That me tormenting her for all of those months, fooling her into thinking I was cheating on her while she actively cheated on me, then destroying her socially and professionally as a result was the catalyst for her meltdown. Maybe it was. Maybe I am heartless sociopath. But as Arthur Fleck so famously said you get what you deserve. 
I gave this woman half of my life and did absolutely everything to be the best possible husband she could ever have. By her own admission, I had no bearing in her decision to step outside of our marriage. She did it for her. Her selfishness knows no bounds, and I am glad to be rid of her. If it makes me the bad guy because I will not go see her and never plan on interacting with her ever again, so be it. I hold true to my damn convictions. She made the choice to betray me. She made the choice to put her needs above the needs of our marriage. So now it's my turn to choose to me over everything else. She can rot in the darkest pit of hell for all I care. Let everyone else help her fix her. My obligation to ever care about her well-being ended the day we signed the separation agreement. I just needed to get this off of my chest. If you're going to cast judgment on me for feeling how I feel, save it. Like I said above, after 23 years and two children, I never really knew this woman after all. I have no sympathy for her, and I never will. Let her rot. I've been informed by Sue's dad that she's been moved from the ICU to the mental health wing. Doctors are still monitoring her mental state. She's conscious and cognitive again, but obviously lethargic. Her father told me she asked, did I come to see her, and he said no, and she shut down after. He respectfully said any further news he'll share only if I inquire, because he understands the headspace I'm in. Also, I've scheduled counseling for 17. The first consultation is this coming Monday. Today, against everything I said in my previous posts and comments, I went to go see Sue. She's been out of the hospital four days now, and believe it or not it was Nina who convinced me I need to see her. She said the only way I'd let God of the contempt I feel for her is to see her one last time in her weakened state. So around 6 p.m., I called her for the first time since I served her. Her hello wasn't the bright and bubbly hello I'd know for over two decades. He voice was hoarse and weak. The moment she heard my voice she immediately began crying. Took almost three minutes for her to regain composure enough to talk again. Before she could say anything, I told her I was coming to see her within the by 8 p.m., and she agreed. It's about an hour and a half from Co-op City, where my new apartment is to my old home, so I grabbed a bite to eat from the local pizzeria and started on my way there. I got there about 7.47 p.m., and she was already at the door before I pulled into the driveway. As I came near, I could see the tool her actions had taken on her. She was noticeably thinner. The unhealthy kind of thin. As a whole, she looked like the walking dead. First thing she does is try to come in for a hug, and I stop her cold. She got the hint that I wasn't there to console her, and backed off immediately. We go inside and sit in the living room. Almost immediately, Sue tells me she wants to come clean, about everything. She tells me she couldn't live with the guilt of what she did to me, and the boys. From the day we signed the separation agreement, she went into a downward spiral of guilty and agony that lead her to her ending attempt. Her friend, the one that called me from the hospital, had noticed her behavior and started coming over to check in on her. She said the doctors told her had she not been found just an hour more, she'd would have succeeded. She admitted to failing me as a wife. That her falling for POS was wrong, as was her choice not to pull back when she knew she was getting too deep. She also apologized for sharing the many intimate details of our marriage and speaking ill of me to him. That she never imagined herself being the kind of person who was capable of doing that, but she was. She said she believed in her head that she was doing the right thing, but ultimately when she thought I was cheating it all hit her like a ton of bricks. The feeling of betrayal was suffocating, and she had to get out of as soon as possible, but it was obviously too late by then. She then asked me at what point did I stop caring, to which I said the night she confronted me with the notion of me cheating with the fervor that did, knowing full well she'd been ducking POS for months at that point, I lost all respect for her and it steeled my resolve to enact my plan. She told me that when she woke up Christmas morning and found the gift I left she was over the moon until she opened it. That when she realized what it was and how much I had known, she literally went mad and hasn't set foot in our bedroom since. She was frantically trying to find if anyone knew where I was, but when she went on FB to ask, she started getting thrashed by friends and family about what she had done, but had no idea how everyone knew so fast. 
That's when I told her about the other binders. The look of shock on her face was priceless. It all dawned her that I did this to her. Everything she's gone through, her friends turning on her, her family shaming her, and yes, even her losing her job was my doing. She just fell silent and shut down after that. I took the time to go use the bathroom then, and it was in shambles. The mirror was broken, her skincare products were all over the place, and the tub looked like it hadn't been cleaned since they took her to the hospital. When I came back out to the living room, she has her face in her hands weeping, and I can honestly say I felt nothing. No more anger, no more rage, and absolutely not a shred of pity. They say the opposite of love is indifference. Looking at her, that's all I felt. She looks up at me and says I screwed everything up. I ruined us, and I have no idea what to do. I can't do this by myself. I tell her she's got her family, her friend who found her, and our sons. But she doesn't have me. She never will, ever again. I tell her I came to give her closure from the ordeal she just subjected herself to, but the moment I walk out that door, I'm never looking back. So the topic of POS comes up not long after. She tells me he reached out to her two days ago, they talked for a couple hours and it ended with her telling him he needs to move on with his life. Find a younger woman and forget she exists. The remainder of the combo was Sue apologizing for he betraying me and asking again, was this really the end? I look her dead in the eyes with no hesitation and say yes, it's been over long before I served the divorce notice on Christmas. I felt that was my cue to depart. No words were said, because what more could be said? I left her sitting on the couch, closed the door behind me, got in my car and drove home. It's 2.56 a.m. as I'm typing this. I needed to get this out while it's fresh in my head. This is it. The saga of Sue is done. Seventeen and I are both scheduled for counseling in the coming weeks. Nina and I are still going strong, and sticking to the plan of keeping things under wraps until my divorce is final. I'm staying active and motivated and looking forward to a future with a woman I know will cherish and honor me, because she's done so from the shadows for decades. It's time for me to focus on the life ahead of me, so this will probably be the last time I post for a while. Maybe I'll come back with an update when the divorce is official. To everyone who has sent me words of encouragement and well wishes, thank you. To all of those who praised me for my plan of revenge, I cab honestly say I wish it never came to it, but if I had to go back and do it again I wouldn't change a single thing I did, aside from maybe doing more to POS than just getting him fired. Update Anyway, it's been just over two months to the day I served my wife divorce papers, and a month since my last update. A lot of people have been concerned with, 17, my youngest son. Just days after my last post he began I see. I went with him his first two sessions, and he's gone by himself for everyone one since. He goes two times a week, and it has drastically helped. For the most part he's doing fine, but I can say that his trust in relationships has been completely shattered. The lasting effects of his own experience with infidelity, coupled with Deal his mother's actions of cheating and her attempted ending, has left a pretty big scar that I think may take decades to heal. I come to find out his experience was even worse than he let on. He actually caught his ex-GF making out with a guy he thought was a friend, but it turned out was only getting buddy-buddy with him to get to her. He never told me this aspect of his breakup. My heart breaks for my son to have had to experience this at such a pivotal point of his formative years. You do all you can to protect your children, but then life goes ahead and says, no. He's decided he's going to stick to IC for the long term, and I have told him if ever he needs to, to talk to me about anything, nothing is out of bounds. Next up there's my IC. It's safe to say, if you've read the bulk of my entries, I have a bit of an anger problem. Which is strange, because I've always been a reserved, controlled and stoic man. But this whole experience evidently woke a sleeping dragon in me that's a pure fire breather. I've talked about everything with my therapist. And when I say everything I mean everything. When I explained to him the extent of what I did to my ex, he was both impressed and appalled. Not the reaction I was expecting. Apparently, I display sociopathic tendencies when provoked, which doesn't surprise me at all given everything I did. 
My sessions are not so much dramatic, they're more so organizational. Unpacking all of the things going on in my head regarding the implosion of my marriage and trying to find balance. Now, for the elephant in the room, Nina. I have no idea where I'd be without this woman. Never did I ever expect to have such a caring, empathetic, nurturing woman by my side to carry me through all of this. We are still very much going strong, and try as we have to keep our ongoing relationship under wraps, it's pretty much out of the bag within our group. She just gets me. She always has since we were teens. And since she knows the pain of having the person you've invested your life into being with cheat on you as well, she does all she can to help me cope with my feelings. We split time between staying at her place and my own. The discussion has come up about moving in with each other, but her five-year-old puts a kibosh on that idea. My place isn't big enough for three people, and I'm locked into my lease until 2022, so for now we'll keep splitting time between. When her daughter is away with her father, Nina's at my place. When she has her daughter, I'm at hers. Speaking of her daughter, I absolutely adore her and she's taken a shining to me. I wish I could find the words to truly put into perspective how important Nina has been to me through all of this. If you haven't taken the time to read my previous entries, Nina has secretly been in love with me since we were sophomore in high school, but she was an ugly duckling back then who thought she had no chance with me. She actively sat by and watched me chase after, date and marry my STBXW Sue knowing how she felt. Well, over 25 years she held this secret until a week after I had my divorce hearing, where we met for food and she laid everything on the table. I consider myself lucky to have her in my life. We constantly talk about what the future hold between us. As we've both been burned by marriage, we're definitely not going that route, but we have discussed a civil union. We'll probably wait a little while before going that route, but it's pretty much decided between the two of us that we are it for each other. Last but not least, the STBXW Sue. What I have to tell everyone about here is that well, there's nothing to tell you. After the final time I spoke to her after her attempted ending, again, if you haven't read up on my story, you should really go to my profile and get caught up on the novella that's been my life since 2019, I've gone 100% and see with. I have no idea how or what she's doing, and I don't care to ever know. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me. That's really about it for the most part. Life goes on. It's March 2nd as of me typing this, so there's just one more month to go regarding the filing going through. By this time next month, I'll be a free man officially. And I'm counting down the days I can finally and truly begin the next chapter of my life. Edit, to clear something up, I made a mistake with my statement about being clinically diagnosed as a sociopath. I assumed because my therapist said I display sociopathic tendencies when provoked that it was a clinical diagnosis. It wasn't, it was just his professional observation. Also, my oldest son 22 has no true intent to do harm to POS. He said what he said out of anger. Update On April 13, just one month ago, Sue officially became my ex-wife. I was initially told by my lawyer that it would go through on the 18th, but due in part to things here in NYC starting to open up with the lowering of COVID cases, it was pushed through a few days earlier. My lawyer Jeff gave me a call on April 12 and asked me to come see him the following day. When I did, he handed me the finalization notice and shook my hand. I couldn't just leave it at that, so I went in and gave him a hug and thanked him for all he'd done for me. On my way home, all I could do was just replay mental movies of everything. The last 24 years of my life. All of the memories. All of the history. When I stepped into my apartment it finally happened. I hit the floor and all the emotion that has been compressed in me came pouring out. I haven't cried like that in ages. But it wasn't a sad cry. Not by any means. My soul felt like it had been set free after being held in the deepest, darkest abyss. The phone call I made that night was to 22. I kept it short and sweet, saying that it's finalized and his mother and I are no longer married as to that day. He asked how I felt, I'm sure he could tell in my voice I'd been crying, and I told him I was fine. Seventeen got on the phone next and we spoke for nearly ninety minutes. 
22 and his fiancée have been doing a great job looking after him, and he's still, like myself, going to therapy. I won't go into detail about what we spoke of, but I will say there's still a lot of work to be done specifically with his view of relationship. Nina came to see me later that night as she always does, and obviously I gave her the news. She just wrapped her arms around my waist and held tight as yes, I cried again. Once I was able to compose myself again, Nina told me no matter what, she will never betray me and loves me with all her heart. And I know every word of it is true. I might catch some flack for saying this as I don't regret the life I build with Sue, and despite all she did give me two strong sons, but it's clear to me now I picked the wrong woman. Nina in the last four and a half months has given so so much and asked nothing in return. All she asks of me is to be there for her. I don't want to drone on about her for too long, but she truly is my hero. There's also some other interesting events that came to pass following the divorce finalization. Case in point, P.O.S. actually reached out to me. Yes, he actually sent me a message here on Reddit. Turns out he saw the story when it blew up on YouTube and immediately recognized that it. Before anyone asks, no? I will not be revealing what his Reddit username is. I think I've made the kid suffer enough. The first thing he did was apologize for his hand in all of this. He gave me a rundown of what the results of the binder I sent his mother did. Essentially, he's been excommunicated from his family. His mother as I learned when I was planning out my payback is a devout Catholic woman. The in church three days a week nomini patri spiritu sante type of devout. So her views on marriage are sacred and learning that her son just broke up a marriage that was almost a quarter century long sent her into a rage. She kicked him out that very day, and within the week when his employer got the binder I sent to them, he was fired as well. He's been couch hopping and trying to find a new job ever since. He claimed he wanted to reach out to me on social media, you know, all of the places he blocked me when he was ducking Sue, but admits he was afraid because in his word if I was able to find him before, I could find him again. I admit I could have went all in on destroying this kid, but I didn't. I asked him when was the last time he saw Sue, and he said he hadn't seen her in months. The last time he had talked to her, Sue told him to forget about her and move on with his life. Which I recall Sue saying the last time I had spoke to her, so at the very least she wasn't lying about that. I asked a few more questions, and the kid was surprisingly forthcoming. I guess he was looking for some kind of penance for the chaos he'd brought upon himself. A lot of what he said mirrored info I'd gleaned from text's documentation I gathered. I didn't do much responding, I just asked and he answered. Convo went on for 20 or so minutes before he said again how sorry he was, and that's when I hit him with this, copy-paste from the convo. You're a 27 years old man who has to live the rest of your life, knowing that your own mother now loathes you for breaking up a marriage that was almost as long as how long you've been breathing. I know you've messaged me because karma is eating at you, but I won't give you closer. When I was 27 I was building a legacy. Right now you're a homeless, jobless homewrecker. If you're smart, you'll learn from this lesson. If you're not, you'll stay a duck up until you're my age, assuming you make it that far. I'd wish you luck, but you don't need luck, you need to get your crap in order. With that, I ended the convo and blocked him. Not the kind of closure he was looking for obviously, and I could have been a lot more hostile, but I think those words will haunt him enough as is. The next major event is that as of May 4, 2021, Nina is now my wife. Over the last two months, we have had long discussion as to where we want things to go between us. Nina made it abundantly clear that she has no intentions of ever being with anyone else but me, and she wants my namesake. She wants to be my wife, and wants me to adopt her daughter, we'll call her Anna, as my own. As I've made mention of in the past, I adore this kid. She's six now, birthday was last month, and she idolizes me. I'm the first father figure she's had since her bio dad pretty much cut out on them when she was four and Nina's made a practice of not introducing any man she's been involved with since her divorce in Anna's life unless they had staying power. Needless to say I have staying power, and experience raising children. And speaking of, Anna and Seventeen are like two peas in a pod. The big bro slash lil sis dynamic between them in both stunning and adorable. 
Seventeenths really clung on to Anna and her revels in it. Had a talk to my therapist about it, and he said it's definitely a good sign. Seventeen sees innocence he wants to protect in Anna, even though his innocence has been shattered. So, we decided last Monday to go to City Hall and pull the trigger. Took 24 hours to get the marriage license, and the reveal was the most uneventful reveal ever conceived. Oz made mention as if no one didn't see this coming and Big Sis said now placing bets on when the now expecting post goes up. We thought where we were keeping our relationship under wraps all these months, but pretty much everyone figured it out already. So yeah, that was kinda hilarious. Some people are going to say it was too soon. And yes, I said in past comment responses that I'm never getting married again, but that was all before the true dynamic between Nina and I manifested. This woman has professed her undying, unconditional love for me. She is laid in my arms and cried saying how happy she is and how she never in a million years imagined she'd ever have the chance to be with me. She's gone in painstaking detail about how she's felt about me the past 25 years and how even while she was married she lamented the notion that Suwon. And I honestly had no idea how deep that rabbit hole went. She even went as far as saying there were times where she herself had thoughts of having an affair with me popped into her head, but she could never be that kind of person. And even so, through all of the years I've known her she has given me so much and asked so little in return. Even the woman I married and had two children with has never shown the amount of love to me that Nina has. I'd be a fool not to give her my name. So now, she has it. And we're in the early stages of paperwork for me adopting Anna. And finally, there's Sue. I've not spoken to her since the last time I visited our marital home, which is going on four months ago. But mutual friends, the ones that are left, do send me updates from time to time. Through one of those friends, a realtor, I know that she sold the house and he gave her a job as a clerical assistant in his firm, and in doing so waived the assisted payments I had to fork over as a result of her unemployment. She now lives in a small apartment close by his office, which he also helped set her up in. She's functioning, but a shell of the woman she was. She's barely gained weight and keeps to herself. She comes in, does her work and doesn't socialize with anyone but him, likely because you know, her socializing with people from work is where this whole thing started. Last update I got on her was at the end of March, where I thanked him for looking out for her, but told him I don't need any more updates she's no longer my problem. I'm almost certain she knows about Nina and I, as some of those surviving mutual friends have commented about us. As 17 is a year away from being a legal adult, I have no reason to ever speak to her again, and I won't. And that's that. My journey of betrayal, revenge, attempted ending and mental agony is over. I'll field questions and perhaps a few comments, but ultimately after this, I'm fading back into the swamp to live with my new frog wife and her little tadpole. December 24th was the two-year anniversary of the night I served my ex and left her for good. A lot has happened since that day, and as I look back at where my life was then compared to where I am now, it amazes me that I'm still standing. A lesser man would have broken going through all I did. But several things pushed me to keep going. The first thing was my youngest son. I needed to be the example to him on how you stick up for yourself and not allow your partner to walk all over your or control the narrative. At the time of D-Day, he himself was cheated on by his first GF. So the notion of his own mother doing the same to me as his ex-GF did to him really did a number on him. The second thing was my now GF Nina. I've known her for 25 years. She'd been in my life years before my ex who was. Over the course of all of this, I'd come to find out that Nina has been into me since day one when we were teens, but never had the heart to confess. When Sue came into the picture, Nina fell back and let me go. But she's always loved me in the shadows ever since. Seeing me going through what I was going through, I guess she felt it was time to let the cat out of the bag. We've been with each other ever since. So what's happened since the last time I posted on Reddit some nine months ago? Nothing. Life has gone on. Nina and I are now living together and in a civil union. All of the perks of marriage, but none of the headaches. If ever it comes to the point where we decide to part ways, we walk away with everything we brought to the union. No lawyers. 
no messy paperwork. We simply break the contract and go our separate ways. I highly doubt that day will come. Nina was also married years ago, with a now six, going on seven soon, daughter from it. We both agreed at the start we'd never do marriage again, which prompted us to look into the civil union route. My sons and her daughter are inseparable when they're together. My boys revealed to me they'd always wanted a little sister, and she's pretty much filling the role. Her and 18's relationship has blossomed into the classic big bro slash little sis dynamic, which I couldn't be more happy for. There was a point in all of this where I feared 18 would completely shut himself off from ever being okay again, but thanks to therapy and lengthy talks to each other, he's come around full circle. Still tool shy around girls his age of course, but I'm not pressuring him. He'll get back on the horse when he's ready. 23 and his fiance are now husband and wife as of August of this year. The wedding was spectacular, and mostly paid for by her folks. I wanted to chip in, but her father, who I'd become good friends with, was well aware of circumstances within divorce and told me he and his wife would cover everything, despite me insisting in putting for something. And yes, Sue, my ex-wife was in attendance. 23 is on better terms with his mother than 18, who hasn't talked to her since the craps house started. Again, that's his choice and I'm not going to force him to maintain a relationship or communication with her until he's ready. The seating arrangements were made so that we'd never lay eyes on each other, though I did get a glimpse of her, or rather what's left of her. The woman I saw wasn't the one I married. She looked frail and weak. Last time I was physically in a room with her, she was 155 pounds. She didn't look anything over 110 pounds bags under her eyes big enough to carry groceries. It was clear that the divorce took a hefty toll on her. In my heart, I wanted to feel pity, but I didn't. There was absolutely nothing there. Nina at one point grabbed my arm tight and asked, was I okay? I told her I was fine, and that today was about my boy becoming a husband. Nothing more. Carrying off of that, I got probably the best news I could get when we went to 23 and his wife's place for Thanksgiving, she's a chef and lives for big events. I'm gonna be a grandpa. His wife was at the time one and a half months pregnant. Had a congratulatory cigar with my boy after dinner, and we talked at length about everything. First time we'd really sat down and had a real man-to-man -man since it all started. He obviously confided in me that he was nervous about it all and even made mention that he wouldn't know what to do if what happened to me happened to him. I told him you can't force anyone to be loyal. You have no control what's going on in their head or heart. You can only control yourself and how you handle it. It's how you handle it that defines you. Soft times make you happy, hard times make you aware. I don't think he's got anything to worry about. His wife worships the ground he walks on, and has been in the trenches with him through all of this. I cherish that girl for keeping my son focused and on task, life a good woman is supposed to do for their man. Gender reveal is next month, and I kinda hope it's girl myself. On the home front, Nina and I are in the early process of discussing the possibility of me adopting her little girl and her taking my name. She has her father's last name, but he's been out of the picture since she was one and has made zero attempts to make contact with anyone. Hell, we don't even know if the dude is alive still. He's definitely not in the US anymore. Nina was born here, but is of Albanian descent. Her ex was born in Albania and had dual citizenship. She he's most likely back in Albania and will never see the dude ever again. Nothing is definite, but Nina has made it clear she doesn't want her daughter carrying the dude's name. And, that's it. I've been living my life one day at a time. Working my tail of and spending time with the love of my life and her darling daughter. Life goes on. So to all of you who read this who are in the darkness, questioning does it ever end and will you ever heal from the betrayal, the answer is yes. But you have to commit yourself to not letting the darkness pull you in. It's easy to just accept your fate and let it consume you. You mean way more to way to many people to let that happen. The same way a cheater not only ruins their own life, but the lives of those around them, allowing yourself to be beaten, does the same. Reach out to the people who love and care for you. Damn feeling ashamed about it, 
walking the path of recovering from infidelity alone is a fool's errand. No good comes of it. Put your faith in those who you know will bolster you. And regarding your cheating a partner? Maybe not go to the lengths I did, but expose the truth once you have it. Find proof, protect your heart and your assets, plan your exit strategy and expose your partner for all to see. Never let them control the narrative. Never accept the gaslighting. Never give in to the blame shifting. If your gut is telling you something is wrong, follow that instinct and find out the truth. Never ignore the red flags. When you're wearing rose-colored glasses, they're impossible to see. And with that, I'm officially retiring this account. There's nothing more for me to say here. To the literal thousands of people who have imparted words of encouragement, praise and insight to me over the last two years, I am forever indebted to you. To the hundreds of people who insist still that my entire ordeal is a made-up book of fiction, if only it were. The internet is a pessimistic place. Believe whatever you want, but if you're investing that much energy into how much something isn't real, maybe you need to get off the internet for a few months. Spend some constructive time in reality and deal with whatever it is in your lives that make you so jaded.